All right, are we ready? All right, so my name is Joshua Moss Howard. Today I am here to give you an introduction to bee trees. So to start us off, what's a tree? You may be asking. You've all probably seen trees before. In computer science, we like to think of the tree uh, as upside down. It kind of helps us visualize what we are trying to talk about. And what are we trying to talk about when we talk about trees? We're talking about an organizational structure for the storage and retrieval of data. So here you see we have a set of data, some numbers, and it's organized into a tree structure. Uh, we can talk about seven as the root node. Our leaf nodes are three, nine, and 13, meaning they don't have children or subtrees extending from below. And this tree that we're looking at right now is a binary search tree. So it's probably something that you're a little bit more familiar with. With a binary search tree, every node has a maximum degree of two, meaning it's not gonna have more than two children or two subtrees branching off of it. And so with a binary search tree, we can talk about the left subtree of a node, which is only going to contain nodes whose values are smaller than the parent node, and the right subtree of a node will have larger, all larger values than that parent node. So with this tree, we have our root node of seven, and you notice that in the left subtree, all of the values are less than seven. So this is, helps us um, find numbers pretty quickly. It helps our efficiency. But there's a problem. Here's another binary search tree. This is all of the same values, but arranged into a different ordering. And suddenly, we've lost kind of all of the benefit that we got out of a tree. Now, if we wanted to search for the number 18, for instance, before, if we were searching for 18, we'd say 18 is bigger than 7, so it'll be in the right subtree. 18 is bigger than 17, so it'll be in the right subtree. Oh, that subtree doesn't exist, so we know 18 is not on this binary search tree. We didn't have to search through all the other nodes. But in this arrangement, suddenly we're going to have to go from the root node of 3 all the way to the leaf node of 17 to be sure that we don't have 18 in our tree. So this is called an unbalanced tree and it has considerable impacts on the efficiency of working with that tree. When you have a balanced binary search tree, you can get a time complexity of big O of log n for insertion, searching, and deletion. But if it becomes unbalanced or degenerate, as that last tree was, suddenly our time complexity is big O of n, because we're having to look at every single element. It's basically like we're looking through a linked list. So you may be asking, what's the remedy, right? We have self-balancing trees. <laughs> there are many different implementations of self-balancing trees, but the general idea is that when you insert an element into the tree, the tree will adjust to ensure that it kind of maintains its balance. And there are self-balancing binary search trees. One implementation is a red-black tree that you guys will hear a bit about later from Tony. But right now I'm going to tell you about another type of self-balancing tree. Bee trees. Winnie the Pooh discovered bee trees. Now, actually, uh, they were invented by Ru Rudolf Bayer and Ed McCrate, working at Boeing Research Labs in 1972. And so what is a bee tree? So here's an example bee tree. Uh, you'll notice right away that suddenly each node can have more than one value, or in the case of bee tree, we call them keys. So our root node in this case has two keys and three children. And that's not a coincidence that it has one more child than it has uh, keys, because the relationship between subtrees and keys in a bee tree is such that you'll notice our left subtree here with one, two, five, and six. All of those numbers are less than seven. Our middle subtree with the values of nine and 12, or the keys of nine and 12, are greater than 7, but less than 16. That's why it's kind of branching off from that spot between 7 and 16. And our right subtree with 18 and 21 uh, consists of keys that have a greater value than 16. So in general, uh, this is an order 5 B tree, by the way, because it has four, a maximum of four keys, meaning a maximum of five children per node. So in general, a B tree of order M Every node has at most m children, so we can't, any node on this tree cannot have more than five children. A non-leaf node with k children contains k minus one keys. That's a little bit of a mouthful, but it's basically what I already said, which is that if you have two keys, like this root node has two keys, you have three children. You have one more children than the number of keys for any given node. 
and the greatest number of children, again, is going to be m, so in this case, 5. So this tree cannot have, any node cannot have more than four keys. And you can kind of tell that the node with 1, 2, 5, and 6, that blue space is sort of full. So you can think of that node as full. It's not going to accept another key inside. The root is going to have at least two children if it's not a leaf node. This satisfies, this tree here satisfies that condition. It has three children. Every non-leaf node except the root has at least the ceiling of m over two children. Another mouthful. Um, so essentially with an order five B tree, any non-leaf node besides the root will have at least three children, right? Because m divided by two is 2.5, rounding up is three children. Here we don't happen to have any non-leaf nodes besides the root, so this rule wouldn't apply to any of the nodes on this tree. And lastly, and very crucially, all leaves appear in the same level. So this is kind of how we maintain a balanced tree and maintain our sort of optimized time complexity that we benefit from with a B tree. But, so you're seeing these constraints, and it, there's kind of a lot going on here. There's a lot of complicated constraints in a B tree, and if you imagine trying to insert values, it can be a lot to juggle. So let's start imagining sort of a simple example. If we were to insert the number 20, we would compare 20 to, so the first thing we do is we find the leaf node where the number would fit. Um, so with the number 20, we compare it to 7, it's larger than 7, it's also larger than 16, so we send it to the right subtree. We compare it to 18, it's larger than 18, and 20 is less than 21, so we sort of set it between those two, which works well because there's space to put it there. Now let's imagine we're trying to insert the number 0. 0 is less than 7, so we would send it to the left subtree with 1, 2, 5, and 6, and we hit a leaf node, that's where we want to put our new key of 0, but there's not room for it, right? We can only have four keys in that node. So what we do is this sort of tricky operation where that node gets split into two, and one of the two nodes is going to have the two smaller values, so in this case, 0 and 1. One of the nodes is going to have the two larger values, 5 and 6, and the median value, which is 2, is going to get promoted to the node above it. It's going to move up. That's pretty tricky, right? So we're going to look at a demonstration. This is a kind of cool site. Um, not the flashiest design, but it's very functional. And it lets you uh, choose a degree for a B tree to create, and then insert and delete values, and kind of like watch how that happens. So I've set up, I hope you can see it. Um, I've set up the tree that we had on this previous slide. Same values. And we're going to insert the number 20. I'm going to make sure the animation is slow enough that you can kind of see it. And so 20 should end up right here, right? It's going to check against the root node. It's going to send it down to this leaf node. And then it's going to insert it between 18 and 21. Simple enough. What about when we insert our 0? So you're going to be watching for it, sending it to this leaf node, and then splitting and promoting the key 2 to the parent node, which in ca this case is the root node. So that was kind of crazy, right? Um, <laughs> kind of crazy. And you can imagine that here's another uh, more com a little bit more complex tree. This one is uh, max degree or an order 3, meaning that it has maximum 3 children and 2 keys. So if we were to try to insert, say, the number negative uh, 3, it's going to try to insert it here, but that's going to split this node and push up to here, which is going to split this node, push up to here, and that's going to have to create a new root node. So you can kind of like watch that happen. Splitting, promoting, splitting, promoting, splitting. So then we end up increasing the height of the tree by 1. Oh. <laughs> uh, so, so that was the demo of kind of how insertion works. But just to sort of reiterate, inserting into a B tree, find the leaf node where the item should be inserted. If the leaf node can accommodate another item, as in it has no more than m minus 1 items, then you can just put it right there. But in the other case, if the node is full, you need to split the node into two and promote that median value above, which may split the parent node. And it could repeat all the way until it reaches the root node, which may need to be split, as you saw. Um, and that will cause the height of the B tree to grow by one. Deleting from a B tree, 
is equally complicated. So I'm not going to go into the logic. It's, you know, we don't have time for that right now. But importantly, it ensures that the B tree continues to meet the constraints and to stay balanced so that you continue to benefit from the time complexity of a B tree, which, speaking of which, is really good. You can maintain that time complexity of big O of log n always for searching, inserting, and deleting operations. So you might be wondering, when are B trees uh, useful to use? Basically, whenever you're interfacing with some kind of external mem memory and the time to access the data of a node greatly exceeds the time spent processing that data. So you can imagine that if you had millions of data points and you couldn't load them all into memory, maybe you just have um, the root node loaded into memory and every time you want to access the children of that node, you are having to read from disk. And that operation, reading from the disk, takes a lot more time than, much, much more time, maybe a hundred times or a thousand times uh, more, that's a thousand times more time than even these sort of complicated operations moving values around. Um, and also, so this is often used when you are doing something like reading a dip from a disk with a database or a file system. And also keep in mind that right now we're using, we used a B tree of order five just to kind of visualize easily. But usually you'd want to maximize how much am I reading all at once. Because if I'm going to the disk anyways to read, I might as well take a bunch of information. So you might have like an order 500 B tree or something like that with up to 500 children. And then you can imagine every time you move from a node to a child node, you're eliminating, because the tree is balanced, uh, you're eliminating like 499 five hundredths of the values contained in that tree every time you go down. So you can really significantly reduce the number of uh, disk reads in your database or in, uh, in your file structure. So that is B trees. I know they're a little bit intimidating, but hopefully with this introduction, you will, if you find a good use case for them, you'll get really excited and go implement them yourself. You can check out these resources and you can Slack me with any questions. Thanks. <laughs>